Welcome and thank you for joining the webinar today. My name is Amanda Jadro. I'm the Portfolio Manager with Tricom. As a financial solutions provider to staffing and consulting industry, it is our philosophy to be an active member in the staffing industry by staying abreast of the ever-changing marketplace. For that reason, Tricom was pleased to launch the Industry Insider webinar series designed to share our expert knowledge and resources with our fellow staffing industry colleagues. One of our core values is to build relationships and become a leading resource to staffing and consulting firms nationwide. Our presenter today is David Seiden. David is the partner in charge of the firm's state and local tax practice. He brings more than 25 years of expertise in all areas of state and local tax, SALT. Dave brings a wealth of knowledge to his clients with experience spanning several industries, including financial services, banking, hedge funds, broker deals, franchising, manufacturing and distribution, staffing, and technology. Prior to joining Citroen Cooperman, Dave was the founder, founding partner of a New York-based SALT consulting firm, SALT Link LLC. Prior to starting his own firm, Dave spent 17 years as a SALT partner at a big four accounting firm where he held various leadership roles. Dave has expansive expertise helping businesses navigate the complexities of multi-state income and franchise taxes, sales tax, payroll tax, and property tax. He has successfully represented taxpayers before tax, state taxing authorities, saving clients millions of dollars in proposed assessments. Today, David will be presenting state tax issues affecting the staffing industry. Staffing firms conducting businesses in multiple states face complex state tax compliance requirements. The current state tax environment presents a unique issue for staffing firms to appropriately determine tax liabilities. State tax expert David Seiden from Citroen Cooperman shares his knowledge of the state tax issues affecting the staffing industry. In today's Industry Insider webinar, David will discuss current state tax environment, nexus, sales tax, income tax, payroll taxes, exposure, and responsible person. By the end of this session, you'll have a better understanding of how the current state tax environment affects your staffing firm. If you have any questions during the presentation, please utilize the Q&A feature located on the right toolbar. After the presentation, there will be time for questions and an opportunity for you to give us your feedback on today's webinar by completing a short exit poll. Please join me in welcoming David Seiden. Thank you, Amanda. And I think I just need to correct you. I want to say we hope they will have a better understanding of state and local tax when this is over. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm David Seiden. There's no way am I going to go through a, an introduction as grand as Amanda just did for myself. Um, I'm here in New York, where as I, I was just explaining to Amanda that uh, after four days now, I guess, since our big blizzard, um, there's very little snow left here in Manhattan. Um, we, I don't think it's had, we've had a freezing day since uh, we got over 30 inches of snow, which is a lot of snow in New York um, City. So um, I'm thrilled to be here today. I'm thrilled to uh, share with you some of my experiences um, over the last 25 years. A lot of what we're going to talk about today um, really um, transponds um, a lot of different industries. And where appropriate, I will try to point out um, how it specifically affects staffing industry, given that's um, the overall topic for today. Um, as Amanda pointed out, these are what we're going to talk about. Uh, these are the items that we're going to talk about today. And let's get started. So, a lot of companies put state tax compliance on the back burner, um, especially when companies are in a growing mode. Um, state taxes are just not really 
um, on owners and controllers' minds when they get a new assignment in a particular state. They just want to get there, get the revenue going, and away we go. Um, having said that, what generally happens is, and believe me, I've seen this hundreds of times, all of a sudden state taxes become very important when one of two things happen. Either a company um, gets notification they're about to be audited, or two, the owner decides they want to sell the company or they get an offer they can't refuse, and then the due diligence comes in and all of a sudden you find that um, you weren't registered, you have exposure, you owe taxes, and all these things that could clog or even kill um, a potential deal. Again, I've been on both sides of that, and the purpose of really today and what I try to explain to clients is the sooner you can get your handle on your state tax posture, the better you're going to be for the long run of your, uh, for your company. For those of you that have ever dealt with state tax auditors, I like to refer to it as the tax tsunami, even though that's not a really nice word, but if you've ever um, dealt with them, these words, confusing, aggressive, ridiculous, hostile, ludicrous, I love the word militant. Um, if you've ever dealt with New York City, that could come into play. Um, these are the common words I hear from clients when they've dealt with uh, state auditors. Um, it's not particularly a fun experience, and, you know, in many instances, it could create um, both a financial um, impact on a company, but more importantly, a lot of times, it's just incredibly time-consuming. And a lot of staffing companies that I know don't have big finance departments that have the time to spend dealing with, you know, a, an auditor's request for thousands of documents that then they have to go and find. So it's not a pleasant environment, and it's not pleasant for a lot of different reasons. Let me give you just kind of a flavor of, of what I'm talking about. First of all, you're dealing with so many different taxing jurisdictions. I think there was 80,000 plus um, here in the U.S., whether you're talking about a state, a city, a village, a county. You know, everybody wants a piece of the pie, and they divide up the pie in all different ways. Um, some jurisdictions do it on a company's net income. Some do it based on gross receipts. Some do it on capital, wages, real property, intangible property, sales, etc. What's important to understand about that is that even companies that aren't profitable on a net income basis can still owe taxes despite the fact that you're not making money. Perfect example would be in Ohio that has the um, CAT tax, which is a gross receipts tax. Washington State that has the B&O tax. There's a lot of taxes out there that don't depend upon simply just net, net income. Another thing that's important to understand about state taxes is that there is a complete lack of uniformity in general when it comes to types of taxes and the rules surrounding them. What do I mean by that? Well, every state, so long as the tax is constitutional, is allowed to impose their own tax and their own rules so long as it doesn't violate the Constitution. So every state exercises that right, and while there are a lot of common themes in state taxes, there are so many little differences among the states. So just because you, know, you have your record keeping in one particular way, let's say you have revenue by based on where your client is located, that doesn't necessarily mean that's the way a state is going to tax your net income. And that's why it's very important to understand the rules in the states in which you do business. We talked about how, how aggressive states are. Well, no kidding, because they're all you know, facing these big deficits, and they have absolutely put the squeeze on their revenue departments to not only enact new laws, which makes it even more complicated, but to aggressively enforce their existing um, laws. And the final complication to all this is the changing economy. You know, what staffing companies looked like 20 years ago is very different from what they look like today. Um, staffing companies used to be, and, and still are to a certain degree, 
you uh, company needs people, you send people over, you bill them at a hundred dollars, and you and you pay the uh, in person thirty dollars or whatever the markups are. You know, today with technology, you have employees all over the country, sometimes never stepping foot inside of a comp in a client. And yet, you've got people now located all over the country as employees, and that's what I refer to as pajama employees, and we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. So that handsome guy at the front of the table is generally me when I have these meetings. Um, a company calls me up and I do these, um, I don't know if daily is the right word, but at least once a week I meet with clients and companies, and I'm the uh, Grim Reaper, if you can't tell. And that's because um, they explain to me that how their business has grown and they're in all these states and they only file in one state, and then I have to be the presenter of bad news that, look, you know, you've got A, exposure for the years that you were in these states and uh, didn't file and or pay taxes, and you know you're going to continue to accumulate these exposures. And oh, by the way, certain taxes, such as sales tax, payroll taxes, any of the fiduciary taxes, uh, there's personal liability to the owners and financial people of the company, even if the company goes bankrupt. So that's the gloom and doom of when I have those meetings. You know, here's the bad news. The good news is, though, you know, there are ways to, to curtail exposures, um, and absolutely there are ways that, um, and there's absolutely ways to minimize the exposure and plan for the future. Start, start with the, the premise of state taxes, because it's really the, the foundation and the most important concept to understand is the term nexus. And the term nexus as it relates to state taxes means the minimum connection a business has with a state that allows that state to either impose a tax on that business or require that business to collect and remit sales tax. So that's what nexus means. Whenever you hear the word as it relates to state taxes, it's a matter of your company's presence in the state crosses a threshold which allows them to tax you or require you to collect and remit sales tax. If you don't know, remember anything else about this seminar, remember that word because it's by far the most important word we have. So, unfortunately, there's no one um, way to determine that minimum connection. Um, it depends upon the tax type. So what do I mean by that? Well, in 1992, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in a case called Quill that in order for a state to require a company to collect a remit sales tax, the company had to have more than a de minimis amount of physical presence in the state. Okay, well that seems to be uh, pretty straightforward. Physical presence meaning, you know, an employee, property, um, some sort of asset in the state. Unfortunately, what they did not do is they did not define what de minimis was. They left it up to the states to decide whether or not a company's pres physical presence in the state was more than de minimis, and de minimis is in the eyes of the beholder. So we have certain states that say, Having an employee come into the state for one day is de, more than de minimis, and therefore we're allowed to, um, for sales tax purposes anyway, require the company to collect or remit sales tax. Other states, um, you know, while they don't have a bright line rule of, you know, five days and then you have nexus. Um, most states take, it's more than one day, but less than 10, and what I advise my clients is to set a policy that once you hit a certain number of man days in a particular state, you should assume you have uh, at least sales tax nexus. Now, I keep on saying the word sales tax because there's a different set of thresholds for income tax. 
Back in 1992, when the, when the High Court uh, decided Quill, for whatever reason in their wisdom, they decided not to include income tax in that definition. So the states took that to mean that you don't need to have a physical presence in the state in order for them to subject a business to tax. What does that mean? Well, what it means is, or what, that, what happened was, it created the concept called economic nexus, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But basically what economic nexus means purely is deriving revenue from in-state residents without actually sending employees into the state. So just building a company in California, uh, and you're, let's say you're a New Jersey or a Massachusetts company, you don't send anybody there, but that's where the company's located, and you derive over a half a million dollars of revenue from that client in California, then that's deemed to be economic nexus, and therefore California is going to subject that company to income tax in the state. The other problem uh, with Nexus is historically, um, you know, it was based on brick and mortar companies. So it was very clear when you had Nexus. Well, today with the new economy and the internet, it's gotten very blurry on what a presence really means. And Congress and the Supreme Court over the last 25 years have opted not to clarify any of the rules and therefore there's absolutely a lack of consistency among the states when deciding, does your company have nexus or don't they have nexus? Do I need to file or don't I need to file? And what is it that I'm supposed to be filing? So these are the new nexuses that I, and I touched on very briefly economic nexus. Now remember, economic nexus only refers to income tax because we said for sales tax there needs to be a physical presence. Now eight states have come out with a bright line test that say if you derive revenue from our in-state residents more than a certain amount then you're deemed to have nexus for income tax. Now eight states it varies anywhere from a high and I think a Washington state is 267,000 so if you generate more than $267,000 from Washington state-based customers, then you're deemed to be subject to their business and occupation tax. The high is New York state, and their threshold is a million dollars. So even if you don't, if you're not a New York-based company, let's say you're a Illinois company, and, but you um, derive, you build clients that are in New York uh, for services that are being rendered elsewhere around the country, even if you don't send people into the state of New York, New York says you have nexus, economic nexus, and therefore required to file in our state. Affiliated nexus is when you have an affiliated company that is acting on your behalf. So if you have a management company and a, another company that has all your employees and the management company oversees the, uh, the staffing company, then any activities of the staffing company and wherever they do business can be deemed to be the same business as the management company and subject them to tax and that's, cause, that's called affiliated nexus. Agency nexus is very similar. Agency Nexus says that if you have independent contractors or agents of yourself, sales reps, or anything along those lines, that even though they're not employees of yours, but they act under your control, then their presence in a given state can cause your company to have Nexus in that state for both income tax and sales tax. And we already talked about the bright line Nexus Again, there's about eight states. Um, just real quickly, like the ones I can remember, New York, Connecticut, uh, Ohio, I think Michigan, Washington State, Colorado, Tennessee, I think. I'm not sure if that's eight. Anyway, there are eight of them, and I'm happy to get them to you if you, ask me, if you want me to. So... Let's talk about the staffing industry. So clearly, 
Um, these are the types of things where maybe historically you didn't think of it in terms of, oh my gosh, these people now are causing me to either have to file a tax return, collect sales tax, whatever it may be. But the use of independent contractors, um, employees that you send into a state for a short-term assignment, or the use of pajama employees. So if you have somebody located in Tennessee and they just work from home on their computer working on a pro an IT project for a customer in Nebraska, then you, your company, has Nexus in Tennessee where this pajama employee is located. And that could mean, that well, definitely means uh, payroll taxes and income taxes and uh, if applicable sales taxes. So here's the good news, bad news about uh, staffing as far as sales tax is concerned. The majority of states do not subject staffing fees to sales tax. Now obviously there are exceptions. There's probably, I think, like six states that do subject um, staffing to sales tax. And most people know what those states are, and you've got to be careful about them. So, you know, Pennsylvania is a perfect example, and there's special rules with it that if you want to break out uh, the markup and your cost of service, then only the markup is subject to sales tax. But if you send your client one fee, um, that includes both the markup and your cost of service, then the entire fee is subject to sales tax. What a lot of companies don't know is that there are certain states, and the perfect example I'll use is New York, um, but here are some others, New Jersey, D.C., that say that while they don't subject staffing fees um, or staffing company fees to sales tax, what they do do is they look at what your people are doing for that fee. And if they are performing what's called a taxable service in that state, then you're required to collect sales tax on that individual's fee um, to your client. And if you don't break out that individual's fee, then you could be subjecting your entire fee to sales tax. Again, so how would that work? So let's just say, for example, that you have um, security, um, like guards and things like that, as a taxable service in New York. So let's say a company wants you to send over, um, they're holding an event, so they want four security people and 10 admin people. Now, admin generally, and just in the big picture of what, whatever admin means, is not subject to sales tax in New York. Security services are. So you would have to itemize out the bill by person and only subject the security piece to sales tax. If you did not do that, then the entire fee would be subject to sales tax. Again, this is something that a lot of companies don't know about, and I've seen it under audit many times. Companies get burned because they don't break it out, and therefore in sales tax, if you don't itemize taxable and non-taxable, Everything is taxable. And I just listed a couple of the, uh, for staff, any staffing companies that do permanent placements, uh, there are, again, a handful of states that subject that fee to sales tax. Okay, so the issue is once you become subject to tax, how do you divvy up the pot to determine what state gets what revenue, and therefore what are they allowed to subject to tax. And that concept is called apportionment. So in the simplest example, on a net income tax or a gross receipts tax basis, what you do is you take, um, just say sales, say one factor, sales, and you take as a fraction your in-state sales over total sales, and then you multiply that fraction by your profits, and that's the amount of profits a particular state can subject to tax. The issue becomes, 
there are different ways to determine what the numerator is of that fraction. And the two most common are what's called cost of performance or market. Again, what we're trying to determine is what is the in-state sales as compared to total sales to come up with a fraction to determine what your, you know, how to divvy up the profits of the company among the states. Two most, um, most common ways, cost of performance. Now, that's pretty simple. You determine the cost, the location of your costs to generate the revenue over total costs. So, for example, if you have uh, $300,000 of cost of your, of your employees located in New Jersey and over a total of a million dollars, then 30% of your profits would be subject to tax in New Jersey. See, that's cost of performance. It is based on the cost, the revenue follows your costs. A total different way of looking at it is some states use what's called market which is irrelevant where your people are located. What's relevant is where your customers are located and where they're receiving the benefit of your services. Obviously, this becomes very important in today's world, especially with companies that do technology work, because you could have people all over the country. But if all the benefit is being derived in New York, then New York would say 100% of that revenue generated by these people all over the country is sourced to New York. So that's the difference in how it's done. Same thing with gross receipts um, states. So you take a state like Ohio, they use market sourcing. So if they only look at if, uh, if you're performing services for Ohio-based companies, then whatever revenue you derive from those customers are subject to their gross receipts tax. And so you, you know, there's, while there's uh, 50 states, um, most use one of these two methods. The key to understand here is that if you give your accountant one spreadsheet that shows how you divvied up your income, it's impossible for that spreadsheet to be right because I can guarantee you uh, at least two of the states on that list have different methodologies. So it can't be right if, because it would only be right if every one of those states used the exact same methodology the way you source that revenue. So be careful on how you give that revenue sourcing to your uh, accountant. These are some of the common uh, things that we see from a staffing perspective, and it's not just staffing, it's really all companies these days, uh, whether it be the Department of Labor issues, uh, the misclassification of employees is probably the biggest. Um, we see this all the time, and all it takes is a disgruntled uh, person that's on a 1099 to go want to collect unemployment insurance uh, for, the, for this whole thing to fall apart. So you've got to be very careful on the issue of employee versus independent contractor. Um, I've seen a lot of companies have a lot of problems with this. Obviously, from a payroll tax issue, you have withholding, you have the minimum wage, and then there's how long do you keep your records for. I get that asked a lot. and There is no one right answer. It depends on the state. Different states have different statute of limitations. And then it depends upon whether or not, you know, God forbid, there's fraud involved or if there's a, a significant misstatement. Um, I'm telling clients these days six years is probably the right number of years. It used to be three, but, oh, one other point. If you don't file in a particular state and you are deemed to have next in that state, there is no statute of limitations. And this is true for all taxes. So unless you filed a return, they can go back to the first day you were in that state to and require you to pay whatever taxes that you owe, uh, regardless of what the statute of limitations is. These are just some 
Um, I, again, we get asked a lot, why us? You know, why did we get picked for this um, audit? And these are just some of the industry, some of the reasons why. Um, you know, sometimes it's just bad luck. Others, um, different states target specific industries. Unhappy employee, um, any of those types of things are the reason why. Um, rarely can you tell specifically unless, I mean, sales tax is easy. Um, what happens is if a customer of yours gets audited and the auditor sees an invoice that should have had sales tax on it but didn't, they go back to their office and send a questionnaire out to that vendor, which could be you. So that's easy to figure out how that happens. With payroll tax and income taxes, it's not quite as easy. And a lot of times those are more in the targeted industry bad luck scenario. So what happens when you know, you've listened to what I had to say, and you say, oh boy, um, based on what Dave said, it appears we have nexus in a handful of states that we haven't been filing in. And it could be an income tax issue, it could be a sales tax issue, it could be a payroll tax issue, whatever the issues are. Most, what do we do? So most states um, have a program called the Voluntary Disclosure um, Program, and you can enter into a voluntary disclosure agreement, a VDA. And basically what a VDA provides is that in return for you coming forward, the state will limit the number of years that they're going to go back and look at um, your tax liability, and they will not impose penalties. Those are the two big benefits of doing a voluntary disclosure. Now keep in mind, a VDA is only, you're only eligible for a VDA if you have not been contacted by the state. So it's one of those, you know, it's not a game, but it's one of those things where, you know, while you're deciding, you're hoping you're not going to get something in the mail from a particular state, because once you've been notified, um, I, I'm not sure of any state that will allow you into their VDA program. Um, now. The limited look back is applicable for all taxes, uh, but they don't allow you in a, in a case where you collected, let's say, sales tax or payroll taxes and did not remit them to the state. While you could still avoid penalties, uh, they're not going to let you keep that money no matter how many years back it goes. So clearly, other than the case of collecting and not remitting, the VDA allows you to limit the number of years that you look back, waive um, your ta uh, penalties, and you know, depending on the particular business, it could be a great way of cleaning up historical um, mistakes. This happens very frequently um, in situations where maybe you're thinking about selling your business uh, or you're now going to be going into a state in a much bigger way than maybe you had historically, or, you know what, I'm tired of the stress of, you know, maybe the, the deck of cards falling down on me. So these are all good options for you to consider, all, all good scenarios that, for considering entering into a VDA. Um, most states, with the exception of New York and a couple of others, uh, allow you to do a VDA on a no-name basis. So most companies use a third-party uh, service provider, your accountant possibly, to do the VDA because if you can't get the right agreement, you could always pull the VDA and the state won't know who the company is. That's important. The worst state, the worst look-back period that I know of is California, just an FYI. Their look-back period is six years, which uh, could be very expensive. So there's a term in tax called responsible person. And the responsible person is generally an owner of a business, an officer in a business, an employee with over financial oversight, and um, members of an LLC. They're not the, the definition changes among the states. So this is a list of 
possible people who could be deemed a responsible person. And what does that mean? Well, it means that uh, as a responsible person, you're going to be personally held liable for certain taxes. So even if the company goes belly up, or let's say that you close the business, but two years later, a state decides to audit the company, but the company's gone, it has no more assets, if you fit into one of these categories, it's, you could be potentially held liable for the taxes that were due by the company. So just be careful if you're one of these people. It's just more the reasons why you want to make sure that your company's in compliance and, you know, and whether you do it through a voluntary disclosure or you're on top of it so that as you enter into new states, um, you're being proactive. Uh, again, what I tell my clients is you've got to set a company policy that if we enter into a state more than X times, X times could be four times, five times, six times, whatever it is, or we generate more than X amount of dollars, we need to register. Now, what does register really mean? It can mean a couple of things. First of all, it can mean register with the Secretary of State. Now, register, registering with the Secretary of State is generally a legal issue. At least that's what I was told a long time ago, that accountants shouldn't be talking about it because it's a legal issue. But somehow it's fallen into uh, state and local tax. And I can tell you there are states out there like Connecticut that says if you are conducting business in our state without being registered with the Secretary of State, that we're going to impose a $300 a month penalty on you. We have seen companies in business over 20 years uh, in Connecticut filing tax returns, doing all the right things, but had never been registered with the Secretary of State and having being assessed $40,000, $50,000 in penalties. And uh, it's just not a great situation. So be careful that if you're going to be doing business in a state, you want to check to make sure whether, you're, whether you should or if your attorney advises you not to, uh, not to uh, register with the Secretary of State. Generally, for income taxes, there's no registration. You just file a tax return. There's definitely a registration for sales tax and payroll taxes. Um, I don't recommend at all, if you're registered for, let's say, payroll taxes, so you have to withhold from an employee in a particular state, by not filing then your income tax return or being registered with the Secretary of State, some states have great cross-matching programs. Most states don't, but it's just a matter of time until they find you. So I've, I've seen many um, staffing companies that are registered for payroll taxes, and I ask them about income tax or sales tax, and they go, oh, we don't file there. And sure enough, um, not all of them, but some, they get notices and they want to know, well, you've been filing here for the last three years with payroll. Where are your other tax returns? So be careful with that. Worst thing, worst thing you could do, and please don't do it, it doesn't matter how bad financially you are, do not collect payroll or sales taxes and not remit it. States will get over most things, and they will cut deals on most things. This is one thing they have zero tolerance for, because you're stealing their money. Remember, you're just an agent for the collection of those taxes. You're the middleman between, let's say, your customer or your employee and the state. They don't take kindly to companies that hold on to the money and don't remit it. And you know what? I've heard the, all the stories. You know, we had to make payroll. We had to do this. We had to do that. The state doesn't care. The only thing you can do is you can, first of all, it's criminal. So you, you could, you know, there are bad things that can happen. But a VDA, and I've had this situation with a client it wasn't a staffing company, but they owed $600,000 of unremitted sales tax, and through VDA, he granted he had to pay it back, but there were no penalties and he didn't go to jail. And so, um, please, just that's another important takeaway of this presentation. You know, I, I, again, I hear it a lot, especially from staffing companies, Look, if I send somebody in, we have 
first of all, we don't have time to register. If, if a client calls me and says they need me in state X and we've never done business in state X, well, I've got to either put a group of people on my payroll immediately or I've got to hire people immediately. And, you know, certain states take 30 days and there is no easy answer to this, okay? But the only thing I can say is you're much better off immediately starting the process than still talking about it six months later. Get registered with the Secretary of State, get registered with the Department of Revenue, and get registered with the Department of Labor, get the paperwork going, and, you know, they will, they will slap your wrist if you're a month late. They will just hang you if it's six months, a year, two years later. All right, so maybe a little dramatic, but you get my point. My point is, is that, again, it gets back to what's your policy? If it was my company and I'm sending somebody in to do a job for one day, I'm not worried about that, and I'm not going to go through the hassle of registering and then withdrawing from the state because that, all that costs money. I totally appreciate it. Compliance is very expensive, but non-compliance is much more expensive. So just think about that. Wow, I guess that's it, eh? Ooh, that's me. By the way, I lost 22 pounds since that picture. Yay me. Okay, so that's it. Um, that's it for the formal presentation. Um, happy to answer any questions if there are any. Um, I think, uh, Amanda, you were mentioning how to do this. Right, exactly. So if anyone has any questions, please go ahead and enter them into the either the Q&A feature or the chat feature. Um, and I will go ahead and just set that slide up. I'll also open up a poll um, for your feedback today. Uh, but in the meantime, as we're um, fielding questions that are going to come in, can you tell me a little bit about uh, some of the common questions that you receive from staffing company owners? Yeah, I think that the most common, you know, I don't know if it's a question as much as it is, you know, the most trying issue they have is one of two things. Either, you know, when do I register? I mean, it, it's if every time I, I went into a new state and I had to register and then it may be the last job I ever do in that state and then I have to deregister and, and it, there's so much paperwork and there's a cost to it, what am I supposed to do? And my answer is, is pretty consistent with, look, there is no, um, the right answer is you have to um, register. But there's also a business decision that companies need to make that, you know what, what's the risk if I have a one-week job and I don't register? So what is the financial risk to me if that happens? And we would quantify it, and then it's up to the company to decide whether or not they want to do, do it correctly and do all the registrations and the costs around it, or are they willing to take that risk in order to, you know, that business risk and say, you know what, I'd rather, you know, accept that risk this time, and if we do another job in the state, at that point we'll reevaluate it. So that's probably the most common issue I hear. Um, unfortunately, what I see the most is just a, just a uniform lack of, of compliance with staffing companies uh, that do business in all these different states and, you know, where are they doing the withholding? Uh, the, the most important thing with the withholding is you withhold where people work, not where they live. All right? So that's the bottom line answer. Withhold where they work, not where they live. So if you have employees that live in, a, you know, an area where they cross state lines to go to work, remember, where they work not where they live. Okay. Good information. I will also go ahead and put up the contact information if you have further questions or would like to talk um, individually with uh, additional questions that you may have about your business needs. You can certainly reach out to David directly. Um, oh, I do have another question that has come in. 
do you have a uh, useful link that we can use for state payroll tax requirements? No. <laughs> I, not because I'm hiding it. I just don't have one off the top of my head. Um, I mean, I'm assuming they want a 50-state one that gives you all the requirements in a particular state. Um, I don't have one. Uh, maybe they could Google it and maybe find something. But, uh, you know, most of, or well, not most, all the work we do is very specific to clients. Um, and with their fact pattern, I just don't have something or a smart chart or something like that that gives you all your answers in one spot. Sorry. Okay. And where do you suggest that someone go and find that information? If they're going to be looking at moving into another state, who should they be asking or what should, research should they be doing? Well, um, you can either ask your accountant or if they don't know, they could um, every state has a Department of Revenue website, and every state has a Secretary of State website. And those two websites, um, if, you know, if you can navigate them, should be able to get you to the information that you need. And, uh, you know, that, that's probably the best way for a company internally to do it or there are firms like mine that obviously, um, you know, could, you'd pay to, to get you those answers or, you know, here's what you need to do and here's how you could do it and we can help you or you can do it yourself and, you know, there's a lot of options. But my suggestion would be if you want to do it yourself, go to every state, just put in, for example, Wisconsin tax and you'll get the DOR, Department of Revenue website, and it will be it will say new businesses they all say the same thing and walk through it and it will tell you how to get registered same thing with secretary of state new businesses okay that's great information okay did you have anything else that you'd like to share with us today about um state taxes or any further information for our participants I'm tapped. I've given you everything <laughs> I know, which means I'm actually two minutes over because I only know 45 minutes worth of stuff. So now we're on to the 48th minute. Okay. Well, I absolutely appreciate the information that you were able to provide us today. My and pleasure. again, for the participants, if you have additional questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, the contact information, phone, email, websites are all on uh, the slide here for you. Uh, again, I'd like to thank our participants for joining us in today's webinar, as well as David for sharing his knowledge of the state tax issues affecting the staffing industry. The recording of this webinar will be available on our website at tricom.com under our Resources and Industry Insider Webinars tab. Thank you again for your participation and watch for information to be released on our next webinar session. Have a great day. Thank you for your time.